Distinguished guest is a man of, who can say that he's one of the few attorneys who uh, have played both sides of the legal ball. Uh, he was a prosecutor, and now he is a defense counsel. He went to Howard University and then on to law school at uh, William and Mary. And he left high school to go into the army as an auto mechanic. And he spent time training in France with their equivalent of the Special Forces. And how he got here, he'll tell you all about it. But uh, he comes with the knowledge of the legal system like very few people have. And it's important for especially the young people here to hear his message. Uh, there's an issue of violent crime, and then there's the issue of other crimes, and including white-collar crimes. And what he can share with you is his experience on both sides of the legal spectrum. And I can't think of a man more suited to cover this in one body, not to, typically we would have, you know, debates here at Black History Month, we'll have legal system reviews as it relates to HBCUs and, and racial issues and so forth. But here's a man that has seen both sides of the legal system when it comes to uh, the law as it applies to us as everyday citizens. I want you to give a warm welcome, please, to uh, none other than Ivan Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bates. My pleasure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody coming out. See Councilman Stokes, see all the other dignitaries, see a judge here, two judges, two judges. I'm, I'm sorry, I see the judges here, but I really also want to say thank you to the students. Some of what I have to talk about today I really want to direct to you because you are our future. And oftentimes in understanding our future, we have to look back at our past. We have to understand our history. Today I want to give a little bit about nonviolent and violent offenders and what does that mean in the criminal justice system? How does the criminal justice system work? Is this a system that we're just going to lock up everybody or is this a system that has hope? And what is the purpose of the criminal justice system? For me it's rather confusing. I know in 1995 I moved to Baltimore, Maryland. Fresh out of law school, William and Mary. And I had a job offer from a judge named David Mitchell. Judge Mitchell operated and did the juvenile division. He was in charge of the juvenile division here in the Circuit Court of Baltimore City. I moved to Baltimore basically to take care of my aunt. Her name was Edna Dennison. She lived right up the street. Uh, apartment success in a tall high rise on the corner, Charles Avenue. North Avenue. And I always remember being here, talking to her, and thinking about what was going on in the city. When I moved here in Baltimore, I was a law clerk. Being a law clerk, you sit there and you help a judge. Your job is to do what the judge needs you to do. And I wanted to be a defense attorney once I stopped being a law clerk. However, one day my aunt was mugged. When she was mugged, I remember receiving a telephone call, and I remember running to help her. I was so afraid, she was afraid, and back then she was 75 years of age. Because my mother had asked me to be the one to help take care of her. She didn't have any brothers, she had a lot of brothers and sisters, but she didn't have any children. At that point in time, I felt like I failed, I wasn't there for her. Eventually they caught the mugger, and 
She was able to get her purse back. But I remember seeing the fear in her eyes, and I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do more. So I applied to the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office in 1995. I was accepted, and I was given a job. And that's where I had the opportunity to meet and work with, here now, Judge Holly Weinstein. It was judges such as her, people such as, as Judge Weinstein, that allowed me to have a foundation to understand the criminal justice system. After I worked in the state's attorney's office for about six years, I was in every division, juvenile, district court, circuit court, homicide division. I was sitting down doing a murder case, and I was telling the judge all the positive things about the person charged with murder. They were going to take a plea. And the judge turned to me and said, Mr. Bates, you appear to be a defense attorney in a prosecutor's suit today. <laughs> and I said, why do you say that? She says, because you're fighting harder for this young man than his own attorney. Wow. That opened my eyes. The criminal justice system needs people on both sides who will fight for you. That judge was Judge Wanda Heard. Yeah. I then became a defense attorney where I worked with a firm named Shulman Tree and Chemical Guild and Ravenel. I worked with an attorney named Ken Ravenel. We had a case that went before the United States Supreme Court. <coughs> and as an attorney, that's the pinnacle of our law profession. Very few attorneys ever have a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. I remember sitting there watching the judges. It was one of the last cases that Judge Conner, the first female judge in the court of Supreme Court ever heard. I remember staring at her because for me, my hero was Thurgood Marshall. And for so many other people, their hero was Justice Conner. I remember sitting there looking at her, understanding that I was in the presence of an individual who had given so much to knock down so many doors. And I understood how important understanding the past was. After working with Ken Ravenel, I then started my own firm, Bates and Garcia, and I've had cases all around the country. I've done all types of cases. Some of the cases that people remember me for is I, I represented um, a police officer in this case called Silk Road. DEA agents, Bitcoins, the case had me in San Francisco. I learned a lot about the federal system in San Francisco. I also represented Sergeant Alicia White and Freddie Gray. Matt. I learned a lot about the police department. I learned a lot about community relations. And many people now view me as the face of the victims in the Gun Trace Task Force. I had about 40 or 50 cases over a five or six year period where I began to represent individuals just because I would see the name Wayne Jenkins on their charge documents. I would take their cases half price or almost pro bono because I figured out what he was doing and no one would listen to me. So I've seen the criminal justice system in ways that have been good and ways that have been bad. I can understand the difference between a non-violent offender and a violent offender. But to understand a criminal justice system, I have to understand the history. See, right now in America, we talk about mass incarceration. We do have a problem. How do we get to this point of mass incarceration? How do we talk about violent and non-violent offenders? And how do we get out of where we are? And understand the history of incarceration in America it didn't start here in the United States of America. Unfortunately, the United States of America just perfected the process of incarcerating individuals. We can sit down and see from the early inception of slavery, bringing our ancestors and many people over to America. You always had the chains, the, that mentality. But in the 1500s, in England, they were using dungeons to lock people up. The United States of America, we had the Jackson era, and that's when we first started to see a shift from dungeons to IE, we're gonna lock people up, we need to have some of the labor to do the work that we need to do. And you have the class divisions. We can sit down and see the progressive era, and that's the era within the criminal justice system where they finally say, we're not just gonna lock people up, we'll give people parole. We'll give people the opportunity to no longer be indentured servants for everybody. We'll give people the opportunity to maybe have a job. And then that's what the criminal justice system looked like until 1970s. In 1970, Richard Nixon signed bills talking about the criminal justice system, and that's where we have the mess that we have today. 
there we decided that we were going to incarcerate individuals and basically take them out of society. And taking them out of society wasn't focused on the rehabilitation. And it's interesting, the progressive era talked about rehabilitation, but from 1970 on, it didn't. And in 1986 is when a lot of what we have now began to happen. That's when Ronald Reagan, we had the war on drugs. The war on drugs criminalized small amounts of drugs, and that disproportionately affected the African American community, but also the disenfranchised communities. And from the 70s and 80s, we began to see the breakdown of family structure. We began to see fathers in jail. We begin to see mothers raising their children alone. And we begin to see jobs leaving the inner city, going out to the suburbs. And the only quote unquote business that a number of the young children see are the drug dealers on the corner. And once again, because we have the war on drugs, a lot of the drug dealers are now being incarcerated for long periods of time. When we had the war on drugs, we had to do something different. We had to leave a message that drugs were bad. Because remember, in 1986, we have cartels. We have Pablo Escobar. We have the violence that are associated with drugs. We have drugs being brought in by kilos and tons. So that's where you begin to see things on the federal side called mandatory minimum. Those are sentences that the judges would have no discretion and people must receive. For instance, back in the day, if you had less than a half a kilo of cocaine, you would have a mandatory sentence of 10 years. But if you had a prior conviction of a drug offense, then that would enhance to 20, 25. Then if you were with somebody that was part of a drug conspiracy and you did something very small, for instance, deliver one bag of crack cocaine, that resulted in a sentence of life. We began to see families broken up. Right now in the United States of America, there are seven million people that every year have contact with the criminal justice system in jail one way or another. <clears throat> what we've done is we've created a system that has and have nots. We've seen a flight from the cities, and we also have seen the war on drugs and criminal justice system decimate African-American community. In the United States of America, compared to the rest of the world, we have the highest rate of incarcerated people. For every 100,000 people, 716, or four point, in Baltimore, 716 people are incarcerated out of every 100,000 people. The United States of America only has 4.4% of the world's population, but yet, 22% of the people incarcerated are United States citizens. Think about that for a moment. The United States of America has decided and made, and we've, we've taken incarceration to a new level. So what do we do? How do we get here? And what are the effects? You can see these policies have had a disproportionate effect on African American communities. What we've seen is that a lot of times, some of the charges, the conspiracy counts, what they've done is they've also entangled families. What they've also done is entangled the mothers of the children. We see the war of crack versus cocaine, and what has that done? Crack cocaine was predominantly in the African American community. Cocaine was predominantly in other communities. The sentences were a lot stiffer for crack cocaine. We look at 28% of all In the state of Maryland, 28% of African American men are arrested criminally. However, 51% of the jail population is African Americans. Think about those numbers for a second. What the criminal justice system has done is decimated the African American community in so many ways. It's breaking down the family structure that we see. What, what are we going to do about this, and how do we get from under this? I believe in opportunity. An opportunity, how do we do that? Because first we had to understand history, we had to understand opportunity. 
In Maryland right now, 27.9% of the population are African American. But 72.4% of jail population is African American, right here in Maryland. And in Maryland, we have to focus on the Just Reinvestment Act that in 2016 Governor Hogan signed. That talked about what we're going to do, getting rid of some of the mandatory sentences, focusing on nonviolent offenders, also violent offenders. Nonviolent offender, what is that? That's a person who tends to make a, have a property crime. Those are crimes that really don't tend to really injure other individuals. They're not as serious. So what are we going to do? With non-serious individuals, should they still go to jail as long? I would argue and say no. But they still must be held accountable. So what are some of the things that we need to do? We can sit down and give individuals community service. We can sit down and make sure they have job training and placement. Those are just some of the few things that we talk about when looking at non-violent and violent offenders. However, we have to have a criminal justice system that also leaves a message and says we're going to hold people accountable. Right now in Baltimore City especially, we have violence exploding. But what is that from? Some of it's from the economic disadvantage. Some of it's from individuals that just are so hurt they don't care who they hurt. And some of it's from individuals that are so poor in our communities that they just need to do it by any means necessary. But what is this criminal justice system going to do? We have to hold violent offenders accountable. Does that mean we lock up everybody? Well, if you're violent, and you're carrying guns, and you're shooting people, you must be held accountable. And those are the things that we have to make sure our system is able to do. I would argue that when you look at a non-violent offender, we have to make sure that we can put them in a position so that they don't eventually gravitate and graduate to being a violent offender. We have to give the non-violent offender the opportunity to understand what's going on. We have to give the non-violent offender the opportunity to be placed in the community service so that they have the skill set to see people around them who are doing positive things. Whether it's a school, whether it's a church, whether it's a business, a non-violent offender can walk around. Two of the things that are most important in the city are safe, clean cities. One, the criminal justice system needs to make sure they're safe, and two, the nonviolent offender, that workforce could be used to try to make sure the city can be clean. How? There are programs already through the court system, programs through the police department, programs through the prosecution's office, programs need to link together and make sure that if you're going to be a nonviolent, if you're going to go ahead and break a window, if you're going to break into a car, I'm going to hold you accountable. And you're going to go back to that community, you're going to clean, you're going to sweep, you're going to do the things to make sure that you understand. The criminal justice system is more than just about locking people up, it's about relationships. A lot of times the individuals that come through the criminal justice system, they don't have the connection to the community. We live in a city right now in a community where we have the have and have nots. People are neighbors and they don't know each other. Once they have the opportunity to know, once they have the opportunity to be invested, that's when they're willing to make a change in who they are and their actions and their behavior. However, if the nonviolent offender does not understand what's going on and they continue to be, and they eventually become violent, then they must be held accountable. So, now that we understand we have an opportunity to make a change, we have to have a plan to make this change. One of the things that I suggest the first thing we do is we go down to the legislature and tell them there's some drugs that you're prosecuting that we have to decriminalize. But the legislature must be the individuals that will do this. For instance, let's look at the marijuana situation that we're here in the city. With marijuana, there are a lot of people that want to decriminalize marijuana. I, for one, believe in that. But the legislature must be the ones that do that. The legislature must join the judges, must join the police, must join the community so they can do a plan. With this plan and understanding marijuana, at that moment in time, the money that the legislature will be able to use from taxing small amounts of marijuana for personal usage, we can use that money to invest in the, in the criminal justice system and in individuals. How do we do that? One, looking at the sentences that individuals receive. Does the individual for marijuana can go ahead and maybe get a year? Well, how do we want to do that when this individual can be trained for job training, skill set, things like that? We need to make sure that we give businesses tax breaks and tax incentives to make sure that they can adequately train the individuals that, from the criminal justice system that they also will believe in. We also talk about the bail industry, cash bail. 
Cash bail for some people is terrible, for other people is great. It just depends how you look at it. I, for one, look at the system that you changed in 2017, the court made a ruling, and the judges don't look at cash bail as often as they used to. Unfortunately, in Baltimore City, that hasn't been the greatest thing in some ways. We have to have a system that invests in pre-trial supervision. What does that mean? That means that if an individual may not necessarily be released to the community, because when you're arrested, you go before the judge, the court, there are two things to look at. One, are you a flight risk? And two, are you a danger to the community, depending on your charge? Well, the judge may wish to want to release you back to the community, but they don't know enough about you. So if they don't feel comfortable, they will incarcerate you. In Baltimore, America City, there's been an increase of 23.6% of the individuals been held since the new rule has been implemented. A number of these judges would gladly send you home on electronic monitoring if they have the opportunity. If we go ahead and legalize marijuana, and it's done properly through the General Assembly, and they can tax it, then that's the money that can be used for the pretrial incarceration programs that we would need to make sure that we can watch some of the nonviolent um, offenders. If you're violent, the judges aren't going to release you. That's just the way the system is. Now, what can we also do in terms of placing people in a position for success? I'm a very big believer on job skills. I'm a very big believer on training of jobs. But how do we do that? Once again, everything is about money. And everything is about making sure the system works properly. And what do we need to do? One, we can have the tax incentives to businesses that are willing to give individuals that have had prior convictions an opportunity and chance. Number two, we can ask the legislature to think about the expungement of certain crimes after a certain time period. Number three, we can have more work release programs. There are programs that will sit down and give individuals of, who may have been convicted of some of the more uh, nonviolent offenses that are doing prison sentences. We can give them the opportunity to have a work release a little sooner than, i.e., paroling out of prison. And we can really make sure, most of all, that we take chances on people. So now that we understand the history, now that we understand the opportunity, now that we have a plan, we must execute that plan. For many people, that sounds like, oh, that sounds great. I don't know how on earth we'd ever do that. Well, I want to tell you about an individual named Corey Warfunk. I couldn't be before you telling you about this plan if I had never done it. In 1992, Mr. Wolfolk lived in Park Heights. His name was Big Corey, and he ran a vicious drug gang in Park Heights. He was so vicious, and his gang was so good at selling drugs, that it caught the attention of the federal government. The federal government in 1992 put out a RICO indictment against Corey and his co-conspirators. They arrested him. He pled guilty and received 500 months to the federal penitentiary, 50 years. <clears throat> Corey, when he entered prison, I asked him what happened. He said, you know, when he got the 500 months, he felt that he deserved every single day of it because he knew what he was doing. Most of the people who are in the ga game and they're really doing the things out on the street, they don't tell you. They understand the rules. If they're doing violence, they recognize it comes a time that they must all sit down. He says he took him the first two or three years just trying to figure out how to survive. At 23 years of age, he went to prison. He liked school, and that was the key. He liked school. In 10th grade, Corey was a good student at Northwest High School. He was kicked out because he got caught with drugs. When he was kicked out, Corey decided he wanted his GED. So Corey ran the drug shop, and he told his partner, if you do the drug shop at night, I can go to school during the day. He signed up for his GED. GED takes usually about six months to complete. He told the man he had 90 days, he needed to hurry up and get back to work. <laughs> Corey completed his GED in 40 days. He's in 10th grade still. But Corey liked school so much, he signed up and went to the local community college. He was very intelligent, but he used that intelligence the wrong way. Like so many of our children, so many of our kids in school, they're very, very intelligent. We just haven't tapped in to their skills. We haven't given them something to be excited about. 
we haven't co connected the education piece with the life experience piece. Corey liked business, but he was in the wrong business. Corey was a leader, but he was leading people down the wrong path. When Corey took us 50 years, he took it. He began to understand what's going on, was with grown men, he put his head in the books. He went from one prison to another prison. Eventually, he decided that I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. I need to figure something out. Every single day, Corey spent time in the law library. Every single day. Corey became so good and so proficient at the law that he applied and received a paralegal degree. Then he applied for uh, another paralegal degree and was given that. Corey began to write briefs and memos for other people that were incarcerated and writing the briefs and memos, they enjoyed it. And they were able to use this to get out of prison. Corey then wrote Judge Motz, who gave him the 50 years. And Judge Motz was so impressed that he brought him back. After 23 years and six months, Judge Motz released him. So Corey gets out. Corey and I have a mutual friend. A mutual friend reaches out to me and says, hey, I know you're looking for a paralegal that does federal work. Could you interview my friend? Mm -hmm. I said, fine. Corey comes to see me, and look, in 1992, I was in college. And I didn't remember what they were wearing in 1992. The same exact sweater that I had in 1992, Corey showed up to my office for a job interview. So I thought either Corey really doesn't have any new clothes because he's been in jail, or Corey just has the worst taste of clothes. As <laughs> Corey comes to see me, Corey doesn't have a resume. I said, hey, I want your resume. He said, I don't have one. See, that's something we also have to remember because people have been incarcerated, they won't have resumes. But what Corey did have is he had a seat, he had a disc. He had the oral arguments of a brief that he had written. And I hear this voice bellowing, and I recognize that voice. That was the voice of our current city solicitor, the former Fourth Circuit Judge, Andre Davis. Judge Davis says, wow, I really wish this young man was here. This is the best well led pro se litigants brief I've ever read. It dealt with an issue post-conviction. Corey wrote a brief. The Fourth Circuit liked the brief, and they've changed the law of post-conviction in the Fourth Circuit. I gave Corey a job because I couldn't come before people and talk about changing people's lives and how the criminal justice system could be used properly if I didn't invest in someone. Gave Corey a job. And Corey's been with me for about two years. Corey is amazing. Corey would have been here today, but Corey got a brief. He got it right tomorrow. <laughs> Corey is amazing. We've taken cases, we've argued cases in front of the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans with big, complex tax litigation briefs. We've won a couple cases on the federal side, but we're not going to tell anybody because very few people won the federal side. I'm not trying to make them mad. <laughs> and we've done and taken our game on a legal way to a whole nother level. And so what did I learn from Corey? I learned the most important to understand our history. We have to give opportunities. We have to have a plan, but we must execute it. If we believe in hope and we understand where we are, we can change what's going on in the criminal justice system. I believe in Corey, and I've seen the change in Corey's life. Where I think we are, if we really want to change our communities, we have to understand the change that's in all of our children. And just because they've made a wrong turn, just because they've been incarcerated, or just because they've been given 50 years or 70 years, never stop believing in them, never make sure that they don't have hope. Because when you take hope away, we're doomed. Thank you very much.